It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Speaker, my question is uh, for the uh, Premier. Premier, your back to work legislation isn't going to fix the chaos you've created in Ontario's classrooms. Yesterday, your Minister of Education said she thought a sense of urgency is really important. She said you had a sense of urgency when you asked the Education Relations Committee for a ruling. I'm not sure, and we're not sure, how waiting 10 days for the ERC to tell you the school year was in jeopardy was showing a sense of urgency, especially since the official opposition gave you the same ruling weeks ago. Premier, will you finally show a sense of urgency, get a deal done so grade 8 students can receive the proper transition they deserve? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, and I know the Minister of Education will want to comment on the specifics, but Mr. Speaker, um, our primary objective has been to get kids back into the classroom. That's why we have been working at the table. There are negotiations going on right now, Mr. Speaker. As we speak, there are conversations at, uh, at various tables to try to get deals. We will continue to work to get that central deal, Mr. Speaker. The Education Relations Commission is the body that has been in place for decades that rules on jeopardy in a school year, Mr. Speaker. And so I know, I know that the, uh, the party opposite doesn't necessarily like to follow due process, doesn't necessarily believe in, uh, in the process, whether it's around collective bargaining or otherwise, Mr. Speaker. But we do. We think it's important when there is a process in place that we follow that process. That's what we've done. The kids are back in school, and that's where they need to stay. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Back to the <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the government has already damaged one school year, and we've been told just a, a little while ago that it won't be business as usual in Ontario Catholic schools in September. Along with the 800,000 elementary school students, Catholic school students yep. will be without any activities outside of regular class this fall. We know there will be a full-blown strike by the end of September. Yep. That isn't a leap. Yep. That isn't speculation. That is what the four unions have said. Yep. Premier, will you get a deal done before the end of this school year, or will you leave the parents and children wondering if the classroom doors will be locked next fall? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Education. Premier, Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And, and you, uh, you spoke about the uh, the uh, English Catholic teachers. And uh, Speaker, I'm here to report that we are actually negotiating with the English Catholic teachers. We have a number of dates working with them over uh, this week and uh, the next couple of weeks. So my intent is to be at the table. And bargaining, and uh, you know, there's lots of rhetoric out there, but there are three months before the school year starts, and I intend to be at the table bargaining, just as we will be with the English Catholic teachers in the next couple of weeks. So um, memos go out and statements get made in the media, but the important thing. Is actually Answer. what happens at the table. It's the only place we can get as Thank you. Excuse, please. Final supplementary. Thank you, Premier. Premier, you've had three of 72 school boards go on strike this past month. Now you have all four unions threatening to strike in the fall. Parents need to prepare, and children don't need this uncertainty. Come September, we will have over two million students not receiving the education they deserve. The right things are going. Your minister hasn't been able to do the job, and you've shown no sense of urgency. So may I suggest, Premier, as an incentive, that you say today that you will fire your Minister of Education ah. if there are any strikes this fall, and put a minister in place that will get the job done. Thank you. Minister? Yes, thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Minister? Actually, what I'd like to do is get a little bit of clarity on their plan for the rest of the day, because what I heard Tuesday night from the official opposition was that they didn't actually Remember think from that Redford, come to order. pass the Protecting the School Year Act, that it was an irrelevant bill. And uh, it'll be coming up for second and third reading, I expect, this afternoon. And I'd actually like to know what their position is going to be when that act comes up because that act is standing between 72,000 Member from Kitchener, and Waterloo. a strike that will start on June 10th if we don't pass the act. So I actually want to know if they still think that act is relevant. Thank you. 
Question the member from Simcoe North. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. The Minister, we will be supporting Bill 103 in second and third readings, okay? Minister Day, with the passage of Bill 103, we will, we will only put a finger in the dam. It's simply a band aid, and you know that. Since last September, the two tiered disaster Bill 122 has seen virtually no bargaining take place with any results. It's, simply, it's been simply a process of finger pointing with no leadership taking place at your ministry. September the 8th is only 102 days away, and that's when the kids go back to school. Turmoil is about to break out. Since September 1st of 2014, 268 days have passed, and all we can say wow. is that back to work legislation will pass to work today. That's all we've got. So, Minister, Minister do, you believe, do you believe Bill 122 is good legislation for the education sector in our province? Bill 122. Thank you. Yes, I do, and it, it, um, it's interesting. I mean, the, the party opposite was against Bill 122 in the first place. The Labour Relations Board actually said that the interpretation that the government had of the uh, legislation was the correct interpretation all along. But uh, what I find really surprising is this government or this party is uh, that campaign on getting rid of 10,000 education workers, 22,000 actually, if you did the math carefully. They thought they'd just get rid of people. Is that their solution for how you handle the issues quickly? Because I actually think the way is to use those uh, 102 days, 103 Answer. days, and make sure that we get agreements in place before we thank go you. back to the school year. Well, supplementary. Well, back, thank you, Speaker, and back to the Minister. So Patrick Brown and the PC caucus believe that Bill 122 is nothing more than a tool for you to avoid transparent bargaining. With only 102 days before turmoil breaks out in all 72 boards in Ontario. Stop the clock. Come to order. Please finish. Thank you, Speaker. We simply cannot see almost 2 million students being faced with education disruptions this September. With all the teacher federations and school boards unanimous in the fact that no bargaining is actually taking place, we are heading for an, election, uh, an education tsunami. Will you, for, will you fix Bill 122 now? so that our students, parents, teachers and boards can do what is best for education, and that is simply teach. Thank you. Yes, sir. You know, I find it uh, quite fascinating. I, I follow the, uh, their leadership campaign pretty closely, and I don't remember Patrick Brown ever having a single thing to say about what education policy in, would be in Ontario if he happened to be the premier. Other, of course, on sex ed. We know what he thinks about that. Nothing else. But what I really want to say, Speaker, is that the... Good thought. Finish, please. Yeah, the, uh, what I really want to talk about is what's happened in the schools this week. The party opposite wants to talk about. Remember from Renfrew, off, second time. Which, which they presume will break out in the fall. I presume we're going to negotiate. Answer. But I want to talk a little bit more about what went on in the schools this week. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister. The education turmoil is growing. There are many very disgusted people with the fact that Bill 122 has been a disaster. Here's an email I got this morning. All the teachers, janitors, secretaries, and even the rats and mice are on the verge of walking out in September of this year if this continues to go on. You, you, think, you think a summer of bargaining under the current legislation will result in all boards and federations coming to agreements. Patrick Brown and the PC caucus believe that the next fall will be spent with one back-to-work legislation being introduced after another. Minister, will you show... Stop the clock. Please, sorry for the interrupt. Thank you, Minister. Minister, will you... Sh Mr. Speaker, thank you. Min Minister, will you show leadership? Admit the two-tiered system is a complete failure and bring in new legislation that will allow everyone in the education system to bargain in good faith and not disrupt 
the education of 2 million students next fall. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. I, I don't believe we have a central table for rats and mice, so we won't be bargaining with them. Everybody else, yes. But I want to talk about I want to talk about what happened in the schools yesterday. What happened in the schools yesterday was that the teachers came back to work. And what I've heard, I've had a chair a conversation with the uh, all three school boards this morning, Speaker, and what each and every one of them reported is that our professional teachers were happy to be back in the classroom, our, our students were be happy to be back in the classroom, and that the teachers were delighted to be able to get back to learning and teaching students. And there's a lot, there is a lot, there is a lot of commitment in each and every classroom in making this school year a success and passing the legislation this Thank afternoon you. will ensure that happens. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Does the Premier believe that Ontarians deserve a right to have a say on whether their Hydro One is sold off? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I do, and in fact, it's why we were very, very clear in our platform and in our budget what our plan was, Mr. Speaker. We were very clear that. Finish, please. Let me just go through some of the uh, some of the public statements, Mr. Speaker. Um, in April 11th news release before uh, before the 2014 election, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One was in the uh, in the headline, and the quote was: "The Ontario government has appointed a council to recommend ways to improve the efficiency and optimize the full value of Hydro One." The 2014 platform, our platform, Mr. Speaker, our Moving Ontario Forward plan includes a balance and Hamilton responsible East approach Creek. to paying for these investments. The funds will be from debt dedicated sources of revenue, asset optimization, Mr. Speaker. Hydro One is mentioned Answer. three times in our budget, Mr. Speaker, in reference to asset modernization. It was fully public that we were going to be looking at our assets. Supplementary. Not a single Ontarian voted to sell off Hydro One last year, Speaker. because, as the Premier has just admitted, the Liberals did not run on it. Minister and of Economic months, Development. They denied that it was even their plan. They stood in this house. In fact, that Premier stood in this house and promised that she wasn't going to sell off and privatize Hydro One. But here we are, Speaker. The Premier is selling off Hydro One. Will she stop this sell off and give Ontarians a chance to have their say through a referendum? So let me just continue, Mr. Speaker, in our uh, budget. And I quote, the government will look at maximizing, the, maximizing and unlocking value from assets it currently holds, including real estate holdings, as well as crown corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Page 164 of the budget, the province's valuable assets Remember include large and complex Bay. government business enterprises such as the LCBO, Hydro One, and OPG. To identify opportunities to optimize the full value and performance of these core assets, the government will launch an in-depth review. Mr. Speaker, page 257, exploring options to unlock the full value of a wide range of valuable provincial assets, including those of large and complex government business enterprises, specifically the LCBO, Hydro One, and, and Ontario Power Water. Generation. Mr. Speaker, we made it very Answer. clear that we were looking at our assets and that we were going to be reviewing them in order to optimize their value. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final Ontario supplementary. Hydro One, and they deserve a say as to whether or not it gets sold off. <laughs> Speaker, they also deserve honesty from their government. The Premier, just six months ago, said that she was not selling off Hydro One. She said this in this very chamber. It is on the Hansard. It is in black and white. That's what she said in this chamber. Yet, lo and behold, Six months later, seven months later, Hydro One is on the auction block. Will this Premier do the right thing and take this question to the people of Ontario? Let them have a referendum on whether their Hydro One is still off the 
question. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm going to read a quote from Hansard from the uh, leader of the third party. But, Mr. Speaker, just remember that what we are talking about here, what the leader of the third party is talking about, is she is talking about not having the funds to pay for the transportation infrastructure around the province that she knows is critical, Mr. Speaker. She knows the Hamilton LRT is. The Minister of Transportation and the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek come to order. Second time for the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Thank you. She knows that those investments are critical, Mr. Speaker, but she does not have a plan to pay for them. Here's what the NDP leader said just days after the uh, last election. It was so clear, Mr. Speaker, that we were optimizing, we were looking at our assets, Mr. Speaker, and that all options were on the table. Sir? Here's what she said. The budget says in black and white that the government is looking at the sale of assets, including Crown corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, Thank unquote. You. NDP leader, July 9th. Thank you. New question. Here, my next question is from the Premier. You know what? That's because I was saying to the people of Ontario, your Premier is about to sell off all of your assets. Thank you for letting them know that I told them about that back in June. Speaker, once this Premier sells off Hydro One, there will be no going back. Bills will skyrocket. We will lose control of an asset that supports education, that puts money into health care, that helps support our investments in infrastructure each and every single year. Minister Does this Premier really uh, think, does services. she really, really think that she has the right to sell off Hydro One without ever asking the permission of Ontarians who own it? Will she do the right thing by the people? Will she actually take a step back and give them their say and hold a referendum on this sell-off? Well, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party knows that we will retain ownership, 40 per cent ownership. The people of Ontario will retain 40 per cent ownership of Hydro One and control of the board, Mr. Speaker. She knows that. She knows full well that the protections, the regulatory protections that are in place now, Mr. Speaker, will continue to be in place in terms of where assets will be built around the province and the price controls, Mr. Speaker. She knows that. She knows all of that. She also knows that in a role of responsibility and leadership, there are difficult decisions. We made a decision that we were going to invest in infrastructure in this province, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party Remember does not, has not supported time. that, which in my opinion, Mr. Speaker, is irresponsible. For in order for this province to grow, we must invest in infrastructure, in roads and bridges and transit. She she doesn't want to do that, Mr. Speaker. She has no plan to do that, Mr. Speaker. We do. We ran on it, and that's the plan that we're implementing, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. Nobody believes this Premier's rhetoric. The bottom line is, I have been talking to Ontarians. I've been listening at town hall meetings across this province to what Ontarians have to say. And I can inform the Premier that Ontarians across, uh, across the province have been saying that they don't want their Hydro One to be sold off. The Premier and every one of her backbenchers knows that Ontarians cannot afford to pay the price of the sell-off of Hydro One because they have been getting thousands upon thousands of emails from Ontarians. If the Premier was so sure of Ontarian support for her sell-off, then she has no reason whatsoever, Speaker, to not have a referendum. Will this Premier agree to ask Ontarians whether Deputy they Oster. believe in public control of Hydro One or a scheme to sell it off to energy speculators, to foreign owners, Question. and to Liberal friends? Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Speaker, I do believe in public control, and Mr. Speaker, that's why we're retaining 40 per cent ownership. And a year ago, the NDP asked us to take our plan to the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We did that a year ago, and this is why we are here, Mr. Speaker, implementing our plan. So here's the here's the rhetoric that the uh, that the leader of the third party is pointing to. The rhetoric of a Barry line, uh, the goal line, Mr. Speaker, electrified weekly trips that will move from 70 to 200. The rhetoric of a Kitchener line, Mr. Speaker, weekly trips of 80. 
to 250. Wow. The rhetoric of a Hamilton LRT, Mr. Speaker. The rhetoric for connecting links being built around the province, Mr. Speaker. The rhetoric of building bridges in communities across the province. That's what she's calling rhetoric. The conversation between the members on one side and the other is going to stop while well, the question is being put and the answer. Wrap up, please. It is not rhetoric, Mr. Speaker, to invest $230 million in rural and northern gas expansion. It's not rhetoric to invest $15 million. million. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. Finish one sentence. $15 million a year in connecting links. That's not rhetoric, Mr. Speaker. That's action, and Thank that's you. what we're doing. Mr. Speaker, $8.2 billion the AG criticized this government for wasting. E-Health, Orange Air Ambulance, the gas plants. This is the most wasteful government in the history of Ontario. That money should have gone into infrastructure, Speaker. And not only that, this government continues to give new corporate tax loopholes and other giveaways to the corporate sector that are going to cost us a billion dollars each and every year, Speaker. And on top of that, we're going to lose $300 million at the very least in revenues from the sell-off of Hydro One. Minister of Economic so Development, second time. It does not belong to the Premier in terms of a decision. It does not belong to the Cabinet. It does not belong to the Liberal Party. It belongs to Ontarians. It's their decision to make. And selling Hydro One without listening to the people of Ontario who own it is completely Question. undemocratic. Will she do the right thing? Will this Premier ask the people of Ontario their opinion Thank through you. a referendum? You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear. In April 2014, we pro produced and delivered a budget that talked very clearly about the need to reinvest in our economy, to grow our economy, and protect the interests of the public. The NDP chose not to even show up to the lockup, Mr. Speaker, and face and deliberate over this budget. Instead. They copied parts of that budget, most of it in fact, and used it in their platform, talking about optimizing assets, Mr. Speaker, talking about how to be cut various things. We didn't cut, Mr. Speaker. We're doing everything possible to reinvest in our economy. In fact, in July, I got a chance to re reintroduce that same budget. And then in October of 2014, we introduced a fall economic statement again reaffirming what we were doing. And then in April of 2015, we put forward Answer. a tremendous budget which talks about investing our economy, growing the economy, reinvesting and improving our returns for the people of Ontario. New question. Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Minister, we've asked you questions about the Ombudsman report into the shameful billing practices at Hydro One. So far, you've only Deputy paid Hellsley, your second time. pain and suffering this disaster has caused hundreds of thousands of Ontarians. As the energy critic for the PC caucus, my office was frequently copied on emails to you from Ontarians in crisis funny, because of Hydro One's disastrous billing practices. This went on for months and months and months, yet it was the Ombudsman who had to step in because you didn't care. Minister, is the reason why your response to this crisis has been so unsympathetic, and I should say pathetic, is that the people who have suffered are largely from rural Ontario and not represented by your Liberal caucus? Question. Listen to them. Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the response to the uh, problems with the IT billing system uh, have been dealt with uh, in over a course of uh, time, Mr. Speaker. There were serious issues that created uh, serious inconvenience with uh, customers across the province, Mr. Speaker. The reality is the Ombudsman did an investigation uh, at the request, I think, of the of the critic, uh, and uh, he received 10,000 complaints, Mr. Speaker, which is a lot. Uh, 3,500 of them were referred uh, to Hydro One. Of those 3,500 referred to Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, 98% of them have been resolved. And, Mr. Speaker. Yes, there was inconvenience, which, which the uh, Hydro One has apologized for, the government has apologized for, but there has been no financial loss to Answer. any of the customers affected. They have been, they have been reinstated, and the money has been refunded to them, they've been given time Thank to you. pay if they didn't receive their bills. It's a responsible response. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Thank you. It was a member from Frontenac, Lennox, and uh, Lan Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and, Ad Lennox and Addington, but it certainly didn't come from you, the request of the Ombudsman. Minister, no one believes for a second that of over 10,000 complaints that have been made to the Ombudsman about Ottawa Hydro or Toronto Hydro, that your ministry wouldn't have responded with lightning speed to the crisis with all the resources you have at your disposal. Now, this, now the situation for Hydro One customers in rural Ontario is about to get even worse. Yep. When your budget bill passes, no officer of this legislature will be able to serve the interests of Hydro One customers Shame. because you Shame are removing oversight. Shame. Minister, Hydro One customers deserve a whole lot better than what you've been giving them. Yep. It brings your whole plan for selling Hydro One into question. Will you commit today and to this question? legislature to remove the sale of Hydro One from your budget bill? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, what we're committing to today is to leave in the legislation the provision that we put there that requires Hydro One to have an ombudsman, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Not only do we require Hydro One to have an ombudsman, Mr. Speaker, but we have retained the services of former uh, Auditor General of Canada, Danny Dozotel, to oversee the implementation of an ombudsman in Hydro One to ensure accountability and transparency, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. That is more than any other uh, Toronto stock. Stock Exchange Company will have, Mr. Speaker, and it will be meaningful, and it will be accountable, and it will be a responsible response. Thank you. Your question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. The Premier might not know this, but I spend many evenings and weekends going door to door talking to my constituents, and whether they follow politics, whether they're Liberals or PCs or NDP. They're telling me they didn't get a say on the Premier's plan to sell Hydro One. They don't want the Premier to sell Hydro One. Will the Premier agree to a referendum on her scheme to sell our Hydro One? Well, Mr. Speaker, I hope that the, uh, the member opposite, when he yeah. is walking around Toronto Danforth uh, and he's talking about our plan to uh, broaden the ownership of Hydro One, I hope he mentions that we are retaining 40 per cent ownership. I hope he mentions that we, no entity or individual can own more than 10 per cent, that the government will continue to own 40 per cent. I hope he mentions that the protections, the regulatory protections that are in place now will remain in place. I hope he also mentions, because Toronto Danforth is a very urban uh, riding, I hope he also mentions that this was a difficult decision that was made because there is a need to invest in transit and transportation infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, and that without that decision, Mr. Speaker, we wouldn't be able to make those investments. Yes, I hope he mentions all that as he walks around Toronto Danforth. Supplementary. Well, I, I do let them know that bankers in Tokyo, New York, Frankfurt will get an opportunity to own their hydro system. Absolutely. But Hydro One belongs to the people of Ontario, and selling it will affect every single one of them. They deserve a say. Will the Premier agree to listen to the people and hold a referendum before the Premier sells off Hydro One? Minister of Energy. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, I think it's important that we actually look at the record, Mr. Speaker. Here is what the NDP leader said just days after the last election. What she say? Quote: The budget says in black and white that the government is looking at the sale of assets, including Crown corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. That July 9, 2014. That was a budget that we introduced before the election and one that we campaigned on, Mr. Speaker. That budget was introduced before the election and afterwards. So the people of Ontario and the leader of the third party knew exactly what we were looking at, Mr. Speaker, exactly what we were contemplating, and it's disingenuous for her to stand up and make the accusations yes, that you're making here today. I, uh, I would ask the, uh, the, the minister to withdraw. Minister, you have to withdraw. Withdraw. New question, the member from Durham. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. 
Minister, you have made it clear that your ministry is pursuing the mandate of transformation of services it offers people living with disabilities. And with these efforts, last week you were in my riding of Durham at Voss Independent Grocers, announcing more resources for people with disabilities to achieve their employment goals. Voss is known for their community stewardship and opportunities they provide for persons with devel developmental disabilities. During your visit, you announced that your ministry is contributing $800,000 to help create a new center of excellence for employment services, which will provide local community employers across the province with training and resources to find best practices, share information, and create environments where individuals which, with disabilities can fully participate in the workforce. Minister, Durham was glad to hear it, but could you please provide the House with more details on how this new center will Question. assist individual employers? Thank you, Minister of Community Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Durham for his question. I think all members know that he's a very strong advocate for okay. people with okay. special okay. needs. An initiative like the Centre of Excellence for Employment Services is an example of the work that we are doing to create an inclusive society which allows for meaningful, competitive employment for those with developmental disabilities. The Centre of Excellence will become a hub of knowledge and expertise in this province on the best ways to match the abilities of individuals to different types of employment, and this is a critical factor for success. The Centre of Excellence for Employment Services is one of 38 projects receiving funding from the Employment and Modernization Fund. This fund is set to deliver $15 million over three years and is part of our $810 million investment yes, in sir. developmental services. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. This new Employment and Modernization Fund is a strong exa example of the way our government is using the innovative leaders in the developmental service sector to make a tangible difference for people with developmental disabilities and their families. However, this was not your only announcement. Last week on your travels, you made a very significant investment in the violence against women sector. Our, our government is helping create a new women's shelter to serve Elgin County. Your ministry is investing more money to replace the existing shelter to better meet the needs for services. Their current location is a 98-year-old single-family home which has reached its capacity and has minimal outdoor Question. space for children to play. Minister, can you please explain to the House how this investment is supporting the government's commitment towards the reduction of violence Thank against you. women? Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And our investment of $1.93 million is something that I'm very proud uh, to speak about. I want to acknowledge the amazing contribution of individuals from Elgin County who raised over a million dollars towards this project. The new Women's Place Emergency Shelter will provide a range of services to women and children who have experienced abuse. The new shelter will be almost five times the size of the existing shelter with bedrooms for families and a large secured yard where children can play safely. Protecting women and children from domestic violence is part of our government's plan to provide more security, protection, and equal opportunity for all Ontarians. Currently, my ministry funds more than 2,000 beds annually dedicated for use by women who experience abuse and their children. This particular investment will help yes, ensure sir. that more women experiencing violence can live in safety, free from threat, fear, or experience Thank you. violence and harassment. Thank you. New question, the member from Halliburton for the Lakes Broth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is, is for the Premier. The Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment has heard from a number of witnesses on the devastating impacts of human trafficking. There is a very clear consensus from witnesses who consistently said there is a severe lack of resources and support for women who want to leave the sex trade. One witness from Rising Angels stated that there needs to be a plan in place to offer these women a way out. 
Premier, it is clear that human trafficking is a serious problem on, in Ontario. This is why I tabled a motion on May 14, which was unanimously supported, that called for the creation of a provincial task force that would offer a coordinated team of officers, Crown attorneys and support services for victims. Premier, will you immediately strike the task force? The Minister Responsible for Women's Issues. Thank you, Speaker, for the question. I want to thank the member for the question, as well as her work on the Select Committee on Sexual Violence and Harassment, all the members who participate on that. And I think we all agree that human trafficking is a deplorable, deplorable activity, and uh, it's one I take extremely seriously as the Minister Responsible for Women's Issues. Uh, and as I talked about in the House last week, we've already taken action on this issue, along with my colleague, the Minister of Community uh, Safety and uh, Correctional Services. We invested over $9 million over the next three years in our language interpreter service so we can expand service to victims of sexual violence, including human trafficking. And last year, we provided $225,000 in funding to the White Ribbon Campaign Answer. to help uh, develop and promote resources to help end human trafficking. We know there's more work Thank to you. do, and I look forward to the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister, um, it's about coordination, which I said in the motion. These young women are moved from one community to another, particularly along Highway 401, where they are prostituted through online ads and social media. The efforts of law enforcement are hindered by multiple investigations into the same perpetrator for crimes in multiple areas. Um, based on debate of my resolution in the chamber uh, two weeks ago, uh, we need a task force, and it was passed unanimously. I'm asking you today, will you take the necessary action by creating a provincial task force to combat human trafficking here in Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. And I couldn't agree more that addressing this very serious issue of human trafficking indeed requires a coordination across government. It's a government approach. The Minister of the Attorney, the Attorney General, the Minister of Safety and Corrections, uh, the Ontario Women's Director. We are working together to help eliminate uh, human trafficking. And I congratulate you on uh, receiving unanimous consent on your motion on the human trafficking issue. So I'm looking forward to um, working with all parties on this. And as, as you know, we have a permanent roundtable on sexual violence and harassment, and that involves representation from the entire sector around sexual violence. And the issue of human Answer. trafficking, I'm sure, will be addressed there as it is in, in your select committee. So I look Thank forward you. to uh, more work in this area. New question. The member from Windsor West. To the Premier. Our schools have been thrown into chaos because of this Liberal government's chronic underfunding of our children's education. And they, the chaos is only growing as the premier hand-picked minister of education fails to do her job and negotiate a deal with teachers. Instead of protecting our schools by getting a deal done, the minister's more focused on cutting funding for our kids. She cut $250 million last year. She's cutting $36 million from textbooks and supplies this year. She's planning even deeper cuts to come. And now the minister is repeating her mistakes by dragging her feet on talks with education support workers who have wanted to no negotiate since last June. That's almost a year, Premier. Speaker, when will the Premier ask Question. the Minister of Education to resign and appoint a minister who knows how to do the job? Premier. Oh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. And, uh, I just say to the uh, to the member opposite, you know, there has been negotiating going on. I understand that there are some discussions that uh, that haven't taken place yet, but Mr. Speaker, they they will. And as I said, we are engaged in uh, in negotiating right now, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, it's important that we have that collective bargaining process, that we find those deals at the table with the education workers, whether they're teachers, Mr. Speaker, whether they're support workers. They are all critical to the education of our children and. The Minister of Education is active.
actively engaged in those negotiations right now, Mr. Speaker. What I would say to the uh, to the party officer, to the uh, third party, is that you know there's a piece of legislation in front of us, Mr. Speaker, that will make sure that kids stay in school. It's very clear that that piece of legislation needs to pass in order for uh, Answer. for kids to be in school. I hope that they will be lending their support to that legislation, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Premier, it was your mess that created where we are now, so you guys can fix it up. To the Minister of Edu the Minister of Education is creating more chaos in our children's schools by failing to do her job. Rather than negotiating a deal with teachers, she's cutting what matters most. $250 million cut last year, 88 schools closed since 2011, and millions cut from special education in schools right across this province. Now we know that this Liberal government has put class size caps on the table, and families know that means one thing. It means even bigger class sizes and even less support for the students who need it most. The Minister of Education is creating chaos for students, and she needs to be fired today. When will the Premier do the right thing and fire the Minister of Education? Minister of Education. Minister of Education. You know, we had 72,000 students that were out of school, and I agree, that was chaotic. But it was this party that didn't want to pass the legislation to end that strike. Fortunately, the Ontario Labour Relations Finish, please. Fortunately, the Ontario Labour Relations Board ruled that it was an unlawful the member from Essex, come to, order. to report that yesterday we had 72,000 students back in schools. They're very professional teachers. Their professional teachers were back there in the classroom doing their job teaching. My question is, the member from Windsor are West, we going to order. allow that strike to resume on June the 10th, or are Thank we going you. to pass the legislation and keep the kids? Thank you. New question. The member from Glengarry, Pascal Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Speaker, in November uh, 2013, not only was I proud, but I was delighted to represent rural Ontario, and I introduced a motion that sought to update Ontario's regulatory framework for off-road vehicles, specifically Regulation 316.03. Amazing. I want to thank the members, all members of this House, for the unanimous support that they gave me on this particular initiative. But as it stands, Speaker, uh, single, only single rider ATVs may travel along certain uh, roads in Ontario, as determined by the province and our municipal partners. Uh, this outdated regulation, Speaker, does not consider uh, new models of off-road vehicles, such as uh, two-ups and side-by-sides, which are used by many of my constituents in Ontario, Prescott, Russell, and across the uh, province. And I understand that the minister has conducted consultations, and I'm asking the minister this, uh, this morning, thank you. could he please update? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I want to begin by thanking the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell for his question, but also, Speaker, I want to say that that member has been an exceptionally strong advocate for his community. That's why he was the first person to introduce a motion on this very important issue, Speaker. Yeah. Speaker, that member understood that those living in northern and rural municipalities depend on ATVs and ORVs for tourism and for local travel. When I became minister, I committed to a collaborative approach to develop, developing solutions for this issue. That's why MTO has been consulting with both the public and stakeholders on updates to the regulatory framework for ORVs. In-person consultations were held on January 15th and 16th, and over 30 different stakeholder groups took part. And in addition, Speaker, proposals were posted to both the regulatory and environmental registries until Tennis, April 13, 2015. Time. I want to assure the member that the stakeholder feedback has been incredibly positive, Answer. and I appreciate the member's continued advocacy on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for his solid and unwavering support on moving Bill 31 through this House. 
I'm very happy, Speaker, to hear that we've received a lot of positive feedback throughout the consultation process. But, Speaker, as I indicated earlier, many of my constituents in Glengarry, Prescott, Russell rely on ATVs and ORVs for tourism, travel, and recreation. And, Speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity to officially invite the minister to my riding of Glengarry, Prescott, Russell, to come and see exactly how useful these vehicles are to those in my riding and across Ontario. While it's important that we update the existing regulations, Minister, uh, Bill 31, making Ontario's Roads Safer Act, also contains provisions relating to off-road vehicles. Speaker, through you, could the Minister please tell the members of this House about uh, more about the off-road vehicle uh, provisions within our government and our road safety regulations? For transportation. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I want to thank that member not only for his advocacy but also for his eloquence in the House here today, Speaker. Many members of this House, Speaker, have already contributed to debate on Bill 31. This bill, Speaker, not only serves to protect drivers on our roads, it also introduces a number of provisions that will help keep pedestrians and cyclists safe in Ontario. Bill 31, Speaker, if passed, will also eliminate the prescriptive definition of low-pressure bearing tires that could affect the future of off-road vehicles, bylaw authorities and municipalities. As I've said many times in the House, Speaker, my number one priority is road safety. The provisions in Bill 31 are a key step forward on this issue. However, I hope to be able to provide further updates on off-road vehicles soon, Speaker, and I should add that members on this side, including those from Thunder Bay and Sault Ste. Marie, Northumberland, Quinty West, Sudbury and others, have long been champions with that member for this important issue. Thank you very much, Speaker. Your question, the member from Dufford Caledon. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, last month I spoke to you about one of my constituents who is looking for help regarding her son's vaccination for meningitis. Peel Public Health told Ms. May that her son would have to get a second shot because he was vaccinated one day before his first birthday. One day, Minister. There comes a point when common sense trumps memos and directives. Will you intervene with the Peel Public Health to ensure that Ms. May's child doesn't have to get a second shot? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate this question. It, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that an error was made uh, by the practicing uh, primary care provider in this case where that vaccination, I understand, I think there were two that were delivered prematurely. Uh, the law requires certain vaccinations uh, prior to school entry, Mr. Speaker, and I know the member opposite agrees with this policy. It's important, and it's about the safety of our children and as they grow into adults, and it's because the evidence is there that vaccinations protect lives. It's very effective. Now, with regards to this specific vaccination, I know that Peel Public Health and the Ministry of Public Health Ontario reviewed the guidelines that are available, and there's a reason, I'll get into it in the supplementary, of why it's important that we wait till that first year, that first birthday, before we vaccinate against MMR measles, mumps, and rubella, as well as meningitis, yes, which are the vaccines in question here. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, I'm not trying to assign blame. I'm trying to solve a problem. So I have a second family. Cheryl Fulcher has been warned that her son will be suspended from school because he got his shot two days oh. before his first birthday. As Cheryl says, they keep saying it's less effective if it's before the first birthday, and I'm thinking it's two days. I'm not a physician. But I have a hard time believing that the efficacy of these vaccinations decreases so dramatically in a day or two that it would warrant the additional cost to the health care system and the inconvenience to these families. Please intervene on behalf of these two families and stop the madness for one or two days. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, this isn't about threatening suspension. This is about the safety of the child. It's an interesting coincidence, actually, that my PhD in public health at Oxford University was granted based on a thesis that I did on immunization of children in their first year of life and the timing of that administration of the vaccine. And the science is obvious and present. It's a federal legislation, Mr. Speaker. Order. It's an Ontario legislation and guidelines. Order. As well. It's the science because children, when they're born, have maternal antibodies that protect them against getting these diseases. Those antibodies wane over time. Science around the world, whether it's the World Health Organization, the Federal Health Agency, Ontario, agree that it's, it is premature to put that child at risk if you're vaccinating them prior to one year of age. That is the policy across this country, Mr. Speaker. It's there for a reason. It's to protect the safety of the child. Answer. Thank you. 
New question, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. My question is to the Premier. Toronto 2015 budget for revenues, marketing, and ceremonies has gone up from $106 million in 2013 to $139 million last year to $157 million last Friday. That's a 48 per cent increase in two years in the budget to attract people to the Games. Why is it that, and are they having trouble is one question. Speaker, with all honesty, if they sold out every seat, the total ticket revenue from the entire Games wouldn't cover those extra marketing costs. Premier, how much extra revenue is the $51 million in new spending expected to bring in? Is it, in fact, less than the $51 million they've spent? The member from Eglinton Have you even checked to see? Question. Thank you. Premier. Minister responsible for Pan Am Games. Minister responsible for the Pan Am Pair Pan Games. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's, uh, I'm happy to take this uh, question, and uh, I was happy also to join the member opposite as we officially opened the Hamilton Stadium uh, last week. And I was very, very proud of that. And um, we had the mayor out. We had uh, we had city councillors out. It was an incredible. It was an incredible event. And Mr. Speaker, I have to speak. I have. It's kind of odd that I have to ask the government side to quiet while the answer is being put. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member opposite knows that these games are about selling tickets, they are about supporting our yes, athletes, sir. but they're also about supporting our infrastructure for the future. Mm -hmm. And going out to a place like Hamilton, knowing that there's a game being played uh, Ham uh, in Hamilton this weekend, England versus Canada. Thank you. Excellent. Oh. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the operating budget is what we're all worried about. Minister, and we don't know what the final bill will be until after the Games. Year after year, we have seen consistent increases in six of the eight lines in the operating budget—25 percent, 27 percent, and 32 percent. But all these cost overruns have been magically offset by two tricks, Speaker. Two tricks. First, they have half the budget. The member from Eglinton Lawrence, second time and stop. Please finish. Speaker, first, they have half the budget for the essential services, such as security, which is quite a trick since security costs have doubled in the last two years. And second, they've practically wiped out their contingency funds, either because they've blown through it or because they needed to make the overall numbers look good. Question. Premier, if these games go $200 million over budget, will you still be paying those executive bonuses? Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. What the member opposite won't tell you is when it comes to infrastructure, we're fifty-seven and a half million dollars under budget. So those are the things they won't tell you about. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we've held, and I spoke about this yesterday, we've held very detailed technical briefings for the member opposite for both there? critics. And there? I don't I don't think I've seen the member show up once. So the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, uh, it, while I'm speaking, is warned. Finish, please. So, you know, we put forward these technical briefings to update our members in this House, the uh, the critics opposite, to provide those detailed information. On one side, member from here Hamilton, he is, Mr. Mountain. Speaker, saying that we're not doing enough to sell tickets, Answer. and on the other side, now he's saying we're spending too much to advertise. So I don't know where the NDP sit when it comes to the Pan Am pair, Pan Am game. Nowhere. But on this Thank side you. of the House, we believe in our. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Yesterday, our government introduced legislation that will add fairness and accountability to the condo sector. And as a person who does live in a condo, I've heard extensively from my neighbours and also from constituents in Kitchener Centre of the need for better oversight of their relationship with condo boards. Modernizing our condo law will be a source of relief to the 1.3 million people in Ontario who do live in condos. Speaker, it's astounding that 50% of the new houses being built in Ontario today 
our condos. And our government is committed to improving this robust sector of the housing market, which already is valued at $43 billion and employs over 300,000 Ontarians Question. every year. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services please inform us of the proposed Protection of Condo Owners Act? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Kitchener Centre for her question and for her advocacy for condo owners. This is, in fact, great news for Ontarians, uh, Speaker. Buying a condo is a significant investment, in fact, maybe the largest purchase in an individual's lifetime. With the many changes in the condo sector over the last 17 years, it's critical that we modernize the Condominium Act to address current concerns. Through a comprehensive public outreach process and an expert panel, we received over 2,200 submissions from condo owners, developers, lawyers, property managers, agents, and members of the public. The Act incorporates key recommendations protecting the investments of condo owners and ensuring they are treated fairly with consistent standards administered by licensed and qualified condo managers. By giving owners better information on their rights and responsibilities, Answer. as well as creating new governance requirements, we are making significant changes to improve this sector's legislation. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister of Government and Consumer Services for the informative response and to his ministry for the work that they're doing on this very important issue. I understand that the Act is going to allow for the creation of what's called delegated administrative authorities. One is going to license condo managers, making sure that they have the training and the qualifications to effectively manage these organizations. And the second proposed delegated administrative authority is going to provide a modern, cost-effective dispute resolution system that's going to see that issues are resolved faster. And doing this also at a much lower cost, saving condo owners tens of thousands of dollars when compared to the current legal process. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please speak to the creation of Question. these delegated administrative authorities and how they're going to add accountability and fairness for condo owners Thank you. in Ontario? Good minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and again to the member from Kitchener Centre, and uh, thank you for the question. The creation of the new delegated administrative authorities is a critical step in adding accountability and oversight to the sector. Delegated authorities have a strong track record of overseeing consumer protection, and in particular, these two new delegated authorities uh, will include specific measures like salary disclosure, uh, the, a process for freedom of information requests. They will be reporting to the Auditor General through oversight and the ministry will be selecting the chair of the board, as well as 49 per cent of the members that make up this board. The condo authority, in addition to providing faster, cost-effective dispute resolution, will provide training for condo board directors, creating standards, uh, forms, and stronger rules for record retention to prevent some of these disputes before they even happen. Speaker, this legislation Answer. is a game-changer for the condo owners in this province, and I look forward to working with members of this House to see this legislation well move done. forward. Thank you. The question the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. Earning an income doesn't come easily to a person with a disability. A person who is deaf or using a wheelchair faces all kinds of barriers in the workplace and beyond. As such, I think it's fair Ontario recognizes this challenge and supports them in their work efforts with the monthly $100 work-related benefit. The work-related benefit helps many gain employment, retain employment, and equally important, to feel good about being able to contribute to their community and to be included in our society. Clearly, you disagree, Minister, which is why you're moving ahead with plans to cut the ODSP work-related benefit. Minister, can you please explain why you're cutting job opportunities for people with disabilities? Thank you. Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Bruce Gray and Sound for the question. And certainly our government does agree that we need to ensure that those with disabilities have every opportunity to participate in the workplace. Uh, so obviously, uh, along with my colleague, the Minister of Employment, uh, uh, economic development and infrastructure, we are working very hard in terms of accessibility opportunities, and there are many different initiatives that our government, in fact, is taking. In relation to the employment-related benefit and uh, the 
idea that our government did uh, propose uh, to fold all seven existing um, uh, employment-related benefits into one, including the work-related benefit. I'm sure the member is aware that we have Answer. delayed implementation of that particular benefit at this time. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Minister of Community and Social Service. I'm glad that you are actually delaying it, but what we need you to do is assure that you're not going to cut that out. People in my office came and said this will be the difference between me keeping a job or not keeping a job. So we need to look at that. You've used the word streamlining and flexibility as code words during your messy SAMS implementation to let vulnerable people with payment delays and stress. So if streamlining means cutting job opportunities for people with disabilities, then you should back down now and not implement that cut. By cutting their work-related benefit, you're forcing people with disabilities to face a very difficult choice. Be trapped at home and not work, meaning they'll need much more in the way of support from your government, or risk injury or even death by working without adequate supports to address their health-related needs. Minister, your actions are unjustifiable. They're discriminatory to people with disabilities. You need to reverse your decision. Will you please do that? Question. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure that my critic is well aware that one of uh, the mandates given to me by our Premier is social assistance reform, and we will be embarking on that very shortly in terms of consultations. This is a very complex process, and it will represent uh, changes for clients. Member from Hamilton Mountain. Employment related benefit in Back conjunction inside. with social assistance reform. Uh, at this point in time, we are not implementing uh, the change that was previously proposed, uh, and we remain committed to minimizing any negative impacts on any changes that we make, especially as it relates to employment. Uh, we have introduced a number of measures to uh, improve employment outcomes for those on social assistance so that individuals receiving social assistance can now earn up to $200 per month with ha without having their monthly benefits impacted and beyond $200 for every dollar Thank earned, you. their monthly benefits will be reduced. Thank you. New question. A member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, uh, two weeks ago, uh, the Ontario Self Employment Benef Benefits Program, or OSEB, was arbitrarily cancelled with no warning, no notice, and no consultation. In my community, the OSEB program has launched hundreds of successful small businesses, creating jobs for many more Londoners and pumping millions into the local economy. The OSEB program filled a unique role by supporting people on EI to become successful entrepreneurs. Premier, how can your government justify cancelling a program that has helped hundreds of unemployed Londoners to start small businesses and create jobs and has already been rigorously evaluated as successful? Thank you. Sir Cheney College University. Sir Cheney College University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's skilled workers, they are our greatest assets. As Premier often refers to our people of Ontario, saying that people of Ontario are our greatest assets. And that's what we, our government has been investing in our people, Mr. Speaker. The Employment Ontario, every year we invest about $1.2 billion through Employment Ontario's various programs and services to about one million Ontarians who benefit from the services we offer in the government. Mr. Speaker, this program, Ontario, um, Ontario Self-Employment Benefit uh, Program, has been a very, cost, uh, very costly program. That's why we have been reviewing it, and we have, uh, we have decided to, uh, to, to, to stop that program and divert the funds to another program. So I will speak more on the specifics of this in the uh, yes, supplementary. Thank you. The member from Northumberland, Quinty West, on a point of order. Order, Speaker. Speaker, uh, they, they got here late. In Bel uh, allow me to introduce my fellow Rotarians from the Bright Rotary Club in the very back row, in the West Gallery. Right. Welcome. Right. To right. Member from Davenport, point of order. Thank you, Mr. S Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Point of order. I'd like to uh, welcome. They arrived a little bit late uh, to the legislature here today. Delegates from the Sporting Club the Portugal with us here today. Board member and head of Sporting Clubhouse, Mr. Bruno de Mascarenhas, Youth Technical Director, Mr. Virgilio Lopes, the head of Grassroots, Mr. Luis Dias, Technical Director of Sporting Academies, Mr. Nuno Figueiredo, as well as Technical Director of Sporting Football Club of Toronto, Mr. Pedro Dias. Bem-vindos aqui a Queens Park. 
And also, Mr. Speaker, uh, with us here today, members from the Stop Community Food Centre, a wonderful organization in my riding. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Mississauga Street, still point of order. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, I would also like to introduce in the members' East Gallery, Mr. Manraj Firma, our summer student in, in our constituency office in Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion to third reading of Bill 80, an act to amend the Ontario Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act and the Animals for Research Act with respect to the possession and breeding of orcas and administrative requirements for animal care. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take their seats. On May 27, 2015, Mr. Nackby moved third reading of Bill 80. All those in favor, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugas. Mr. Dugas. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Moro. Mr. Moro. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Domerlo. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Malone. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. DeNovo. Ms. DeNovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Gelinas. Madame Gelinas. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabasti. Mr. Yakabasti. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Europe. Mr. Europe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. The ayes being 74 and the nays being 18, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have another deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 49, an act with respect to immigration to Ontario and the related amendment to health, uh, the Regulated Health Professions Act 1991. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill. On May 12, uh, May 12, 2015, Mr. Chan moved third reading of Bill 49. All those in favor, please uh, rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. 
Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Chan. Sorry, Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Ver Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sat. Ms. Sat. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Angelina. Mr. Angelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Polls, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Declared a motion to carry. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it will do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.